Gentlemen, I'm here today with Mike Brace, and Mike is uh, the head of Hydrokinetic uh, Labs, and uh, he has come up with a really, he's got some background in producing electricity, I think, and other things, and he'll tell you about that, but he's really come up with a really, really neat way, an alternative, and uh, and a clean alternative at that, to produce electric, uh, electricity. Mike, welcome to the show today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, you, you, as I just mentioned, you're the head of Hydrokinetic Labs. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Um, I started off about 30 years ago as an engineer in aerospace, mm -hmm. working in aerospace composites, specializing in ultralight structures. So I'm kind of a structures person. Um, when that industry kind of slowed down a bit, I migrated to electric vehicles, which has always been a passion of mine, mm -hmm. in, in designing and building electrical drive systems, motors, uh, generators, drive control systems, and ended up building on and off-road full-blown vehicle systems. Mm -hmm. In other words, I, I'm not the generator expert, but I know where to find them, and I mm -hmm. know what I need, or I'm not the drive motor expert, but I know mm -hmm. where to find them. Mm -hmm. I did that for a number of years, and then the current company I work for hired me to design and build a hybrid drive system for them. Mm -hmm. And um, they eventually decided not to do this. This was about 10 years ago when Toyota just introduced theirs. So instead, they asked me to stay and run their test labs in their R&D center and design and build the test stands that actually they use for a lot of their power transmissions components. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of what started me in that. Um, while I was while I was working with them and with a previous employer at Clark Forklifts, I was a a, a, a very active member on our on our parent website we call EVWorld.com, which is dedicated to electric and alternative ve fueled vehicles. Um, the gentleman who runs that, a gentleman named you know, Bill Moore, he asked me to be his technical editor for the engineering questions that would come mm -hmm. and to do engineering analysis of the new companies that were coming along, companies like Tesla, and then when you know, when, when Prius was coming out to look at these things and, and, and blog and write on his website about it. Let me, let, me, let me stop you there just a second. So you have actually uh, worked with some of the electric cars deals that are coming out now. Very much correct? so, yeah. Actually, Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, and I'll let you continue, but uh, do you feel excited that those are, that technology is going to work for us? Or? Finally. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's, um, uh, you know, it's kind of a funny known fact, but at the turn of the 19th century, Two-thirds of the vehicles on the road were electric. Mm -hmm. Self-powered vehicles were mm -hmm. electric. And, um, you know, around 1915, there were 250 electric car manufacturers. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, and Thomas Edison had some, and he was working with Henry Ford. And then gas kind of insidiously took over, and a lot of that is... It has gone by the wayside, but now that gas is getting to the point where it's, it's going to get more scarce and less affordable, people are looking back saying, well, you know, maybe this electric cars aren't such a bad idea. And they, they have been around for over 150 so years. Is, so is it your feeling that they're, that uh, automakers are very serious at this time about trying to make this a practical thing to work, that uh, practical and affordable to, to have electric cars? I think they're serious enough for... for uh, to, for salvation, to, to mm -hmm. for for self preservation, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been reluctant in the past to to pursue electric vehicles because, let's say, they're more expensive than gas vehicles, but you pay for the fuel up front, mm -hmm. and the marketplace doesn't usually accept something like that. Mm -hmm. They'd say, "Pay a little now and pay as you go." And then the the other part about electric vehicles that's not too many is they don't have a lot of moving parts, since there's not a lot of aftermarket or service required to them. I, I, something I hadn't thought about at oh, all. Oh, I have an electric motorcycle I drive to and from work, and uh -huh. including the wheels, it only has six moving parts, and it goes 70 miles an hour with no transmission, no no multi-speed transmission. Unbelievable. And, and that's the the EV1 that that uh, General Motors made back in the 1994. It's mm -hmm. the movie Who Killed the Electric Car was about that. At that time, that was General Motors' fastest production vehicle ever. It could go 183 miles an hour on one single gear. Unbelievable. That's yeah. something that I'm sure that we are. Uh, <laughs> no, but, you know, but to that point, that's what, you know, I, I see the engineering delight behind electric vehicles and why they are such a good alternative to mm -hmm. most conventional means. But that's kind of what got me started right. in, 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 in large electric structure, so to speak. So. Okay. Now, this, this device that we're seeing here on the table uh, it is something that I guess this is a model that you that's correct. that you have come up uh, that's right. with here to to generate power. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, about two or three years ago, I, I was very well aware of what companies were doing to generate power with wind, and you know, familiar with T. Boone Pickens and his plans, and and Vestas and those companies that make, and then some of the solar companies and things like that. 
There's not a lot of hydrokinetics, though. I mean, if you actually go to the, register yourself as a company on the government website and ask for a PCS code, which is what do you do, mm -hmm. uh, you won't even find one for hydrokinetic because most of the dams that have been built, well, they won't build anymore. I mean, nobody wants to build any more dams. And so that technology is kind of, kind of like the electric car has been slid aside. Is that what you mean when you say hydrokinetic? That is hydrokinetic that is or hydropower, let's call it that way. Well, in the last three to five years, there's been a resurgence and, and what we'll call current technology, which is tidal currents, river currents, and uh, wave, wave energy. And so a number of people said there's a lot of untapped potential energy there. And so we have seen a number of companies come forward and offer uh, designs to tap that energy and produce usable electricity with it. Mm -hmm. I looked at it a different way. I looked at a way to saying, if I had to, if I had to use a river, I, I want to use it in the most ecologically friendly, friendly manner. I don't want to put a turbine maker in there, something that they call sushi maker, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I and you call it sushi maker because it kills the fish. Yeah, it's just a turbine right. underwater. Just, okay, right. You know, and, and there's a lot of, including Oregon, doesn't want to put them in the rivers because mm -hmm. they're not ecologically friendly. They're, they're efficient for what they do, but they're rather small in scale, and they're not very ecologically friendly. And most of them, they're, by nature, their design has been the type of turbine you put at the bottom of a large dam. and takes advantage of the large head pressure coming through. So they're not really well designed for just what we call run of river current, where you just basically the river's moving along very slowly. And so I started looking uh, literally across the river when I look at, at the coal plant saying, well, that's a really good grid tie. And if I, could, if I could make a generator that they could tie onto their grid, then during peak hours, they could use that electricity instead of shoveling more coal to meet peak demand mm -hmm. and then get greenhouse carbon credit for it. So I'm trying to make this to supplement actually coal plants, and there are over 600 in the U.S., of which 500 are on major rivers that this device would work in. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the real trick was making something that's usable. Most, most river turbines for run of current river are, are you know, 0.3 to 0.4 megawatts, not a lot of power. So most, including the Department of Energy, um, generally considers those to be something that will come of age to supplement increasing energy demands, not existing energy demands. Does, does, does this device produce electricity as some of us laymen might understand uh, water flowing over a dam? Is it? No, no, it's no, not that, no. That. And, and that's kind of one of, it's, it's, this is not the, the perfect de device design. I mean, you know, if you were to look at any series of ways to generate power, there's probably a more perfect way. But I, I, one, I wanted to make it something the most ecologically friendly. Mm -hmm. This thing rotates very slow. I call it Project Slow Flow. It rotates very slowly, 3 RPM. I mean, fish can swim around this thing and laugh all day. Yeah, and, that, and as you mentioned previously, that is important these days. Very important. Two, it, the water, I, I'm basic, I want it to work at the very bottom of the deepest rivers in incompressible flow. In, in water being incompressible, it can't go over it. It has to go through it. Mm -hmm. And so if it's near the surface, true, water could actually come and go over it. But if, if you kid it down 20, 30, 40 feet below the surface, which is some of the average depths south of Cincinnati and the Ohio, mm -hmm. the water can't go over it. It can't pick itself up. So it has to go through it. So it, it, what it is, in effect, is it's actually a dynamometer that re measures river current mm -hmm. using resistance to measure river current. And a very powerful one. When I first, when I first approached this, um, I looked at the possibilities and said between 4 to 8 megawatts. But after we built the three-dimensional models and then ran the formulas, it's actually 8 to 12 megawatts which is 25 times more powerful than a turbine of its same size, so to speak. So th there's enormous possi possibilities and enormous upside to this, isn't there? That's, um, that's what we're kind of hoping. We're, we're try we try to find a solution that works to meet everybody's need, not just, not just, uh, not just the environmentalists, but the, the grid's needs. Like I said, I didn't want to design something that I needed to make a grid infrastructure change for. I just wanted to go right onto the grid, right at the, the coal plants mm -hmm. where they have a grid tied to them. So they can actually purchase the electricity from these things and resell it cheaper than they could for shoveling coal to do it.